is to roll out a common funding agreement for use by all Victorian government departments funding NFP, NFP community organisations to deliver community projects, businesses and services. We are also developing the Victorian Government Portal for regulatory compliance, a single online access for all government information about regulatory requirements where Victorian NFP community organisations can access all regulatory information, licences and other important support materials. Are you still thinking about the cockatoo? <laughs> you probably are. Strengthening the NFP sector and community organisations also mean offering more support, training and assistance, and it means providing more opportunities for organisations to get together and learn from experts and from one another. Victoria's Office for the Community Sector is leading the implementation of a range of government priori priorities affecting the not-for-profit sector across the whole of the Victorian Government. The office works closely with the sector and with other Victorian government departments to mainly develop an appropriately skilled and flexible workforce, improve the uptake of information and community technology, communication technology, particularly throughout rural and regional Victoria, achieve efficiencies in service delivery, management practices, and also to build innovative partnerships with entrepreneurs, philanthropic organisations and business. So in conclusion, implementing these wide ranging reforms requires a committed whole of government effort, as well as a close partnership with the NFP and the community sector. It's heartening to see the willingness of the sector to work in active partnership to drive these reforms. These strategic partnerships have also had other benefits for representative organisations, such as helping them to build new community networks. We know that we will only achieve a stronger Victoria and Australia by working collaboratively with the sector so we are focusing on improving communications and sharing information on policy challenges as well as emerging social issues and themes. This is important and a productive partnership. We can truly achieve much by working together to create resilient, livable and prosperous communities. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to declare our Communities 2011 Annual Communities in Control Conference open. Thank you very much. Thanks, Damien. And Damien does have to head off now, but we're really very grateful that at such short notice he was able to step into the breach and cover so capably for Peter Ryan and really to engage us, I think, very well with the topic of, of this conference. So thanks again, Damien. Our next speaker is a woman who currently holds one of the most influential positions in, the, uh, in relation to the uh, Australian community sector. As Chair of the Australian Government's Not-for-Profit Sector Re Reform Council, Linda Lavash is sitting at the apex of some of those fundamental changes that we are speaking about and that I brought up a little earlier. The office has been established to help the government achieve its aims of providing smarter regulation, improving transparency and cutting red tape. Hallelujah to that. Linda also holds a key position of research fellow at the Australian Centre of Philanthropy and Non-Profit Studies at QUT, which is, uh, which is really leading some of the reform in these areas. A former state member of the Queensland Parliament, Linda was Queensland's first woman Attorney General. She currently serves as a director on the boards of the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation and Hockey Queensland. Please make her welcome. Thanks, Linda. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for a wonderful Victorian welcome. Melbourne is my second favourite city. Um, Brisbane, of course, is my first. And can I say good morning, all my fellow Queenslanders? Where are you? Oh, my goodness, there's more Queenslanders than Victorians. <laughs> And I'm sure the Victorians will soon be Queenslanders. <laughs> the, this is an exciting time and I, I want to say thank you to our community for all the work that you do and the, um, and the contribution you make to the sector through the information uh, on the Our Community website. At QUT we find it very um, inf uh, um, informative and um, quite often it's my second port of call. 
um, for um, practical advice for the sector. What I wanted to do this morning was um, give you just a run through what is happening at the nation, on the national um, scene in relation to the reforms of the not-for-profit sector. But so much is happening and they've only given me an hour slot. So if you will forgive me, I will run through the slides I have quite quickly because what I would uh, benefit from most here this morning is from feedback from you. You um, can, uh, I will um, give you sort of the uh, broad brush picture of what's happening, but on the council, one of the things that we do is give advice to government, but we can only get that advice from the sector itself. And the members of the council um, operate in, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, representative of the sector from, very, uh, from its various levels. Um, but the more information we have, the more feedback we can give. So is everyone happy if I do that? You can tell me, if you've got any questions along the way, please um, put your hand up or um, stand up. Um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, if you want to stop me, I'm um, quite happy for that to happen. But what I thought I would start with is someone asked me recently, if you had to picture how regulation and how government engagement with the sector um, happens now, how, how would you depict it? And I thought about it for a while and um, as Joe said, I'm on the uh, direct on the Australian Cervical Cancer Foundation. We do a lot of work in Nepal and Central Asia. And the picture that came to mind as I thought about how um, the sector is regulated in Australia is this picture here. <laughs> Has anyone been to Nepal, Central Asia, had to sort of um, bend under um, extension leads running across streets. Um, goodness knows how they get the power in, but they all seem to have the TV going. So I thought about the sector, which is regulated at um, the um, state and federal government level to some extent, and, and some areas of the sector are also regulated at the local government level. And on top of that, then there's what we call the soft regulation, the contracts, the funding agreements, the service agreements. And they all mix in together somehow to try and empower you to do the work that you do, but in a very in inefficient way. Now, following this same theme, how do I uh, want the sector to look or how should the sector look? And this is the picture I've come up with. Now, the, using that same theme of, of energy and power, it's the sector that energises our community, that empowers our community. And what I believe we should be aiming for is a strong core um, with uh, having the tower of power. Um, and I unashamedly say that to see that happening at a national level, supported by all Australian governments. Clear lines of registration, reporting, information, enforcement, and that tiered reporting, the tiered understanding. The other reason I've used this depiction is in the energy sector, we can now generate power in Townsville and sell it here to Melbourne. We no longer have that old rail gauge where things didn't fit between the states. Why can't we do that for the regulation of the not-for-profit sector in Australia? Now, Damien before spoke of the size of the sector, and I think it's important to always recognise um, that the not-for-profit sector is a significant economic contributor to the country. It hasn't been measured in economic terms before and I, I, we owe a lot to the Productivity Commission report for starting those measurements. We've understood it in terms of volunteer hours and term, um, time spent volunteering but not bringing it all together. And the information we have um, still relates back to 06, 07 and part of the uh, recommendations of the Product Productivity Commission report is to continue that measurement so that 
we know the significance and size of the sector and what's happening in the sector. So I'll just run through these couple of slides um, and you no doubt have heard the figures before. This slide um, information is a little bit dated now and it needs updating, but it's done out of America by Lester Salomon, who um, surveyed 35 countries around the world back in 2003, found that Australia is the blue mark in the middle with the world's seventh largest economy when it comes to the not-for-profit sector, that NGOs had $1.3 trillion in expenditure or 5.1 per cent of combined GDP. So we punch above our weight when it comes to the world stage with NGOs. There are 600,000 not-for-profits in Australia, although there are only um, 60,000 economically significant um, not-for-profit organisations. That's those who employ people and who um, operate more than on a volunteer basis. The 600,000 can range from the, um, you know, the Malt Whiskey Appreciation Club, um, the tennis associations, um, to um, including unincorporated bodies such as the Australian Labor Party and most of the trade unions are unincorporated. So the, the sector um, is um, quite diverse. It's, one of the interesting um, statistics is that the sector em is employing about 8% of the labour um, workforce in Australia today. The manufacturing sector employs about 8.8% and is in decline in terms of the employment. The not-for-profit sector is um, growing in, um, in terms of workforce participation. And nearly 5 million volunteers contribute over $14 billion. This next slide shows the, how that growth is. It's happening at about 7.7% um, per annum. And we'll know more as we continue to measure um, the contribution of the sector. And whilst the sector is of vital importance to the community, it's, it also should be seen in its economic significance to Australia. I'll just run through the history of where we are today with the reforms and, and what's happening because I think it's important to understand that we've had 15 years of inquiries and reports that have brought us to where we are today. Um, some may believe we're still at the starting gate, it's what we do next that uh, will really shape what happens for the sector in terms of um, regulation and uh, engagement with the government, uh, with all governments. So the, we've had a number of reports. Over the last 15 years, there's been five significant um, reports into reform that have recommended reforms in the sector. It started back in 1995 with the um, Charitable Organisations in Australia review by the Industry Commission. We've had the definition of charities and related organisations report in 2001. Then there have been various states and territory reviews, including the review of the not-for-profit sector regula um, not-for-profit regulation by the Victorian State Services Authority in 2008. Um, then there's a Senate inquiry into disclosure regimes for charities and not-for-profit organisations 2008, and of course, um, early last year, the Productivity Commission report a contribution of the not-for-profit sector. Its recommendations focused on measuring the sector's contribution to society and removing obstacles to maximising the contributions. And then we had the Henry Review, um, Australia's Future Tax System. Now, 2010 became the landmark year for the recognition that, reform, um, that the recommendations that had been made previously should be picked up and those words put into action. Actually, at QUT, we did a project where uh, we were measuring the uh, regulation of the sector, and someone suggested that we count the words that have, um, of you know, how many words of regulation the sector has. But we decided to look at the number of reports because when uh, we had our first council meeting, our minister, um, Tanya Plibersek, said to us, well, I understand the sector has consultation fatigue and that we'll move past consultation 
it is my aim we move into implementation. So we looked at the number of words of that consultation fatigue and do you know that uh, the submissions made by the sector to those reviews in the last 15 years is about 25 million words. That's all your work. And I'm sure every time a consultation paper, discussion paper, position paper, issues paper, white paper, green paper comes out, you just go, oh no, here we go again. What's the point? Well, here we are, 2011, and this is the point. Because in 2010, the year started with the release of the Productivity Commission report. Then we had the National Compact that was um, launched um, with about 80 organisations in March last year. And I believe there's about 600 organisations have signed up to the National Compact. And then there were the election commitments made by um, Julia Gillard and the Labor Party, and they have now become the government actions. Um, those, the election commitments in July 2010. Now I'll just skip through the Productivity Commission report. Um, I'm sure you've all read it in detail. And the National Compact, which is available on the not-for-profit website. I'll just skip through those slides. Because I wanted to get to the, the election commitments. Now those commitments were to set up the office for the not-for-profit sector. And the reason that um, this commitment was made was the sector engages with government by your activity, your purpose or your object. So housing, uh, affordable and, and um, housing groups or um, you know, with, um, homeless programs deal with, with housing. Uh, community to community, sports to sports, environment to environment, Indigenous um, programs to um, Indigenous uh, policy units. So what happens is the, the sector is not seen as a unified sector. We are seen as our, our mission, which is not bad, which is, you know, which, which, as you should be. But what was happening is, as the, as the sector is not seen as a unified sector, then those matters of regulation or government relation which deal with the sector as a whole, like your legal structure, fundraising licences and regulation, gaming licences and regulation, were not looked at in a unified manner and which cause, can cause more red tape, more administrative burden than a lot of the other matters that you're engaging with government on. So by having an office of the not-for-profit sector, looking, taking that overarching umbrella view is that you can see where the problems lie, you can see where the reforms are needed on a whole of sector basis. To support the office for the not-for-profit sector it was also a commitment to set up the the, uh, the council, the not-for-profit sector reform council, of which I have the honour of chairing. The council was established in December last year after uh, expressions of interest were advertised and I believe there was about 400 expressions of interest to be on that council. Now that's a volunteer council. That shows you the interest, commitment and dedication of people in the sector that they're willing to put their name forward to be on the council to give strategic advice and work with the federal government on the implementation of their reforms. We also um, had a commitment to, or the, the government um, commitment made was to um, release a scoping study into having a national regulator. That study was um, released earlier this year and what um, has occurred since then, on May the 10th, the budget was handed down and it was announced that there will be funding for um, a national regulator, but the regulator will be called a commission, the Australian Charities and not um, for Not-for-Profits Commission, and the um, commission will be commenced as of 1 July 2012, and I'll talk about that just in a minute. 
There was also um, the election commitments in relation to red tape reduction, um, in, which include reforms on contract provisions, procurement and grants, greater consistency between all government departments, streamlined reporting, and, um, the, and then there was the harmonisation um, COAG. Um, commitments as well, which is the program in relation to, I think the first one is the fundraising regulation, harmonisation of the, the fundraising laws. And there has recently been a referral in relation to associations and corporations through the COAG process. The next slide is the um, Office for the Not-for-Profit Sector sits in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Its areas of responsibility are whole of government coordination of the not-for-profit um, reform, support the not-for-profit sector reform council, progress the national compact working together, promote volunteering and promote philanthropy and social investment. The office is, um, ooh, went too far. The office is headed up um, by um, Helen McDevitt, but comes under the um, section in Prime Minister and Cabinet Office of Work and Family, Paul Ronalds. The, um, the, there's a small team at the office, but they're a great team. I've enjoy, I'm enjoying working with them. There's also Andrew Coogan, um, is a contact point with regards to volunteering, social innovation, philanthropy issues and um, Helen is also responsible for the social inclusion unit. Now, this is the website um, for the, um, the not-for-profit sector. This is the, the government website. It um, hasn't been officially launched yet, but um, we're putting it in, uh, it's up and running now, uh, which will be www.notforprofit.gov.au. So that will tell you what's happening at a national level. Um, and as you can see, includes social inclusion and the national compact there. Now this is the, uh, not the Reform Council, the makeup of the Reform Council. The details of the Reform Council members are on the website, and I'll just run through them. There's Anne Robinson, who's the Deputy Chair. She's from Pro Legis Lawyers in Sydney. Evelyn O'Loughlin from Volunteering South Australia and Northern Territory. Sandy Blackburn-Wright from Westpac. Michael um, Coleman from KPMG, Cassandra Goldie from ACOS, Glenn Appleyard from the Australian Accounting Standards Board, David Crosby from the Community Council for Australia, Ken Baker from, M from NDS, Susie Hazelhurst from Margabala Mag Books, sorry, um, Aboriginal Corporation, she's from Broome, Frank Quinlan, who's now with the Mental Health Council of Australia, Casey Chambers from Anglicare, and Ron Edwards has joined us as an ex officio member. He's on the Australian Social Inclusion Board, and uh, Ron's doing some work um, with us in relation to a proposed um, working with children's passport. Now, the council has met twice. It, it, the council's been set up for three years, meet, meeting quarterly. And of course, there's so much to do and so much happening that it all can't be done in one day at a meeting once every three months. So what I've done as chair, we've set up um, four working groups under the council. We have a working group that's looking at the national regulator, reducing red tape, harmonisation of legislation and the national compact. We met in um, Canberra last Wednesday and have now set up a further working group looking at the what we're calling the unrelated commercial activities tax as well. And um, I'll mention that there was a, another consultation paper put out last Friday in relation to the, uh, from the Assistant Treasurer on the better targeting of not-for-profit tax concessions. That um, is one that you know, we should have a look at. And I believe it's, um, I think it's about early July is the um, submission dates on that one. But um, what um, each of the groups has been doing, and, and the working groups have co-opted um, people from all over the, um, all over Australia and on all um, areas of the sector to give us expert, expert advice and um, information and help with the processes of the advice that we give government. So I'll just run through those quickly. We've got the National Regulator Working Group. 
which provides advice on the new regulatory arrangements, the implementation of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission and the implementation of a reporting portal. And I'll come back to that reporting portal because I'd like your feedback on what information or what reports should go into a national information portal. The second group is the Reducing Red Tape Working Group, which is providing advice on common funding agreements, streamlined financial reporting, streamlined performance and outcome reporting, and improved risk management. And I've got a couple of questions there as well. There's the Harmonisation Working Group, uh, which is providing advice on harmonisation of fundraising legislation and the harmonisation of working with children's checks. I understand that this really came to the fore um, with the uh, rescue and recovery in the Queensland floods earlier this year where national organisations were sending workers up to Queensland to help at the emergency release centres, but Queensland requires you to have a blue card to work with children and they found that um, you know, people coming, the workers coming in from interstate not having a blue card then caused this dilemma. So uh, the work that Ron Edwards and Casey Chambers are, are looking at, which I believe has been, um, has been recommended before, is having a working with children passport so that you could work anywhere in Australia with children under the one passport, because each state and territory has its own um, requirements of, of working with children. Now, I believe that there's the barrier to that at the moment is getting the um, database for the police criminal checks aligned. But there's certainly, um, you know, it makes good sense across the country that if you're going to, you know, if, if you're from Victoria and you want to work in Queensland with children, that you shouldn't be barred because you don't have the Queensland blue card and that then have to wait, you know, six to eight weeks to get a blue card out of Queensland. So that's um, one of the major projects that group is doing. Then we have the, uh, the National Compact Working Group. Uh, which is ways to make the National Com Compact more meaningful, meaningful, to bring it to life. That group has already recommended that the, there be um, the first two protocols that be co-created between the sector and government uh, under the compact be firstly in relation to consultation, that um, there be um, protocols put in place in relation to the how um, government um, conducts its consultations, the timing of those consultations, um, and um, the um, uh, what um, is then done with the the report, um, the submissions made. But there are some other matters in relation to that that um, require discussion and co-creation. It'll be um, how to make the government more accountable and how to make the relationship more productive and beneficial for all Australians. There's um, some um, six recommendations that have come out of the working group um, that have now been put to, to government, uh, put to the minister. Now, I'll, this next slide, I'm sorry it's a little bit busy, but I was trying to capture, since the buz budget announcements in May, where um, the, um, everything sits, because we now have two ministers. We have the Assistant Treasurer, who will be um, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits um, Commission and Commissioner, will be answerable to the Assistant Treasurer, uh, Bill Shorten, and then we have the Minister for Social Inclusion, Tanya Pli um, the Minister for Human Services and... Um, Tanya Plibersek, where the Office for the Not-for-Profit Sector um, is, is answerable, and they're working um, in tandem there. The, um, on Friday, the announcement was made that Robert Fitzgerald, the Productivity Commissioner, will be um, chairing the Advisory Council for the Commission. The um, report from the budget was that an implementation task force would be convened um, that would work in the next year to um, settle on the um, priorities for the Commission and the work that the Commission will do. It was um, reported at that time that the Charities Commission would um, 
what will happen to the nexus at the moment where the tax office decides whether you have um, charitable status and then what concessions you get uh, will be broken. So the, the Commission will decide whether you have charitable status and then the tax office will um, then determine what the concessions are. In that way, there's no conflict of interest, um, as was perceived with the tax office making those decisions and um, looking at the, um, the definition of charity, as, as Joe said. Now, the, um, the slide just takes you through, um, as at 1 July, um, this year, the implementation task force will be in place. They've got a year to work towards putting the commission up and running. So what I'll do is just go now. I'll finish my presentation. I hope that sort of gives an, an overview of what's happening at the, the national level. We'll have the, the Office for the Not-for-Profit Sector um, giving policy and um, strategic advice to all the departments um, supported by the council. The, co the Commission will be established as of 1 July next year, which will look firstly at the Commonwealth um, regulation. It'll be, um, the questions will be asked with the new housing regulator, with the um, ORIC um, in relation to Indigenous corporations, how do they fit in with the Commission, uh, what will happen um, with the COAG, um, harmonisation projects, what role will the Commission take in relation to education and, um, and um, working with the states towards harmonisation and hopefully cooperation. So all those big questions are out there. There'll be consultations in, consultation in relation to the definition of charity. There'll be consultation, um, as, as I said, the, there's a um, new paper has been released in relation to the tax concessions. So um, I hope that is, is you know, it, I know it sounds a little confusing, but it's all, um, the, it's all happening. What happens next in bringing it all together is critical, not just for government, but um, and, and uh, but most critical for the sector. So these are the questions I've come, I've put up. We have um, officers from the Department of Finance and Deregulation sitting on the council meetings with us. And one of the um, questions that um, they've asked us to, for feedback on is they're putting together um, a, uh, I suppose, a, a model grant um, protocol and said they were starting with low risk grants. So they've asked the council what we would consider is a low risk grant. So. I'd be very interested to hear your feedback. Some suggested that the, um, the volunteer grants under FAXIA, I think they're $5,000 grants and you, your grant is advised by letter um, and there's no need to report back but you keep your receipts. So our grant, uh, is it low risk in terms of the dollar threshold? Is it low risk in relation to the activity? A Harmony Day grants or one-off grants less uh, a lower risk than ongoing grants or as has been suggested is it who the grant is for the organization if the government has a long-term relationship with an organization does that make the grant uh, you know the funding to an organization low risk because of that long-term relationship it's about the relationship not um, just about the money and the um, and the activity. So they're very interested to know because that will determine um, what then will be, if they're considered low risk, then that will minimise the reporting requirements back. The second question I had was in relation to the information portal. Um, the Minister has said that, um, that it is a priority for the implementation task force to come up with how that portal will, will be, will be utilised. One of the suggestions is that um, just for simple reporting information, like when you change the address of the organisation, that you only have to report it once into the information portal at a national level, the states cooperate, and then that information is then available to all um, of the department's agencies 
um, and regulators that need to, to know that information. So just simple information about an organisation only has to be reported once to the information portal. It will be critical then for the states to um, be part of that information portal. Um, but it, it may well be that um, the advice back is that we want to go right through to the reporting, um, the financial reporting, and see whether that can be kicked off straight away at the same time. So, Dennis, I think I hope that's generated some thought. It has, and I think um, this is a really important subject because this is about to happen to all of us. So while red tape and simplification and all those words mightn't appear that important, this is a profound change that is happening within the community sector. As an ex-bureaucrat for 20 years and as a person that's been fighting the bureaucracy for the last 15 years, I would probably say there's a direct correlation between red tape and the number of public servants. <laughs> and I think um, the less public servants, usually the less red tape. But that's slightly naughty of me, so I'm going to leave that up to the audience to challenge um, some of those views and to offer any of the suggestions on the in-questions that Linda's posed to you. But if they're not covered on those questions, feel free, this is your time to raise them with Linda to take back to the wider committee um, and to hopefully see some change that's going to occur across the sector. I think let's have a round of applause for Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>